Thank you so much for introducing me, and thank you, Listen and the College of St. Rose, who invited me here today. Um, it is an honor to be able to speak for you guys, and I'm so excited to see all of your faces out there. Um, it's just such beauty. So, um, well, that's a bit about me. Um, breaking the silence for me does not only begin with silence and end with our voices being heard. This is not only a day for us to speak out against bullying, but a day for us to speak up for all of us who are unable to be heard in our schools and communities on a daily basis. This is a day to celebrate our diversity and to collectively show the world how important our individual voices are. This is a day to give us strength to express this wish every day. For too long, we have allowed hatred and evil to be seen as natural components of humanity. For too long, we have allowed this evil to exist in our institutions, in our elementary, middle, high schools, and beyond. For too long, we've been silenced by our bullies and by the administration, faculty, peers, teachers, who do not stand up when they witness an act of bullying or harassment. For too long, we've allowed this institutionalized oppression of our brothers, sisters, friends, family, children, and everyone in between. For too long, we've stood silent at the face of a situation that we cannot find a simple answer to solve. What I ask for us today is to all stand in solidarity. Everyone in here and everyone under the infinite acronym that begins but does not end with LGBT and our allies must stand together in order to speak for the voices that are silenced, even if it is our own. We can no longer let a bully have the last word. A few months back, walking around on my campus, I heard someone walking behind me say, that's so retarded. Although not specifically related to LGBT bullying and this person was a complete stranger, I turned around and asked her what she had just said. I don't want to hear that language in my community. I don't want to hear that on my campus. I don't want anyone to feel unsafe around me. She hesitated and didn't know what to do. In that moment, I asked her not to use that sort of language because it directly and indirectly hurts a group of people who every day try to be the best of themselves that they can be, regardless of what sort of handicap they have. She didn't respond in anger. In fact, she seemed kind of calmed. Her high energy was balanced by my calm, non-attacking, nor angry response where I clearly stated why I was offended and what I needed from her. This is not how I respond to every situation, but this is how I wish I did. We can feel anger, and I definitely do. By all means, let yourself feel that anger when you witness something terrible, when you witness something that hurts you, someone you care about, or anything like that. Feel that anger because that anger shows that you deeply care about something. Anger can show that you are passionate. You wouldn't get angry over something you didn't care about. Anger is a very, very important emotion for us to recognize, believe in, and respect when we feel it. But when responding, something to consider is that perhaps the bully doesn't even really realize what words are coming out of their mouth, what they're saying, or what they're doing. My professor the other day, I think maybe because she knew that I was going to come speak here, she told me a story about her friend who's an elementary school teacher. And this teacher happens to be bullied by parents during parent and teacher conferences, something that really opened my eyes. When one parent during one of those conferences said something especially offensive and angry directed directly at this teacher's character, um, the teacher responded with, pardon me? To which the parent didn't feel like repeating what they had said because they realized after it came out of their mouth that they didn't actually believe in it. I think that's a really great thing to consider. If someone can't repeat something twice, maybe they didn't realize what they were saying the first time. When we speak from a place of anger, we can't speak clearly or explain our needs and wishes. When we speak from a place of reflecting, of honest intentions, and a wish for something better, we can prevent the lack of, un of listening that happens in these situations. It's all about understanding. But most importantly, and I'll be completely honest, it has taken me years and years to speak from a place not from anger. It takes a long time, and the most important thing is to speak at all. Speak regardless of how you're going to speak. Speaking is better than not. Together we can end that silence. Are all bullies uneducated or unsure about something, and that's why they attack it? No. Are all bullies insecure? No. Are all bullies inherently evil people? No. One of my favorite musicians is Ani DeFranco, a woman who helped me through high school. Um, her music guided me every single day. Such beauty. One of her songs, Hour Follows Hour, she sings that maybe we are both good people who have done some bad things. Are bullies good people who have done some bad things? I can't say for sure, but that's because there's no one type of bully and we do not know of their or our own future and who they're going to become. That's why it's hard for us to completely end bullying. The only solution I've seen is for us to stand up for one another and to speak up even if the person directly involved cannot. As other LGBT persons and allies, 
we have the right to speak up when we feel uncomfortable, or when we feel a situation around us is uncomfortable, or when we downright see something unacceptable. That's what it means to break the silence. I'm gonna give a disclaimer right now, because I'm gonna share with you a story about my brother. Um, I asked the folks in charge here if it was okay for me to use a very real story with very real language. Um, this by no means is a, a green light that this language is acceptable, but I just wanted to give that trigger warning. So I've always loved Gandhi's teaching that we must be the change we wish to see in this world. It's one of my favorite things, so I made a t-shirt about it. Um, <laughs> but I want to see a lab change. I want to see it every single day. I don't want to just see it today. I think today is a beginning, but never an ending. I dream to see us no longer allow ourselves to become victims but instead to become educators that convey the good that exists within our hearts. I'm gonna share this story because I understand why some of us cannot be there. Because I understand how some of us cannot make something that we are not. I've been down and out for months at a time. The fight taken out of me by my brother when I was in middle school and high school, telling me that I'm a tranny who should just kill himself because I'll end up a faggot and no one will ever love me. I hated my brother at those times. I hated him for years. Being full of such hatred, I could not imagine a better world. But I'm thankful that I felt that, that I felt the absolute evil that overtakes our bullies and overtakes us at times. It prevents us from listening. It prevents us from conveying our needs and listening to others' needs. It prevents a lot of things, but it's there. I was silent to my brother's cries. He's, he's older than me, he's two years older. Um, and I call him JT. I was silent to my older brother's cries of help as he felt so insecure, and seeing his younger sister, myself, know at the age of 15 and be confident in my identity that I was a man, was dwarfing his own insecurities and his own needs. He wasn't able to express what he wanted because he was so scared that because I was younger, that I was his younger sister able to express this, how on earth would that make him feel? My confidence, even though it was just an air and I had shaky hands, scared him. That is not my fault, and I'm not excusing my brother's actions. This is something that I've realized in the past few years. But I refuse to let myself become a victim of him as I grew older. And I did not want to victimize him either. It was hard not to fall into that trap, so I fell. It was beyond difficult to see how I would ever forgive him, how I would ever be able to call him my brother again after five years of physical, emotional, and verbal abuse. It was beyond difficult to see how I'd be able to get up in the morning and go to school knowing that him and his friends would be there, constantly pushing me back, making me feel unsafe, and silencing me. It was impossible for me to think that at the end of the school day, I could go home to a safe house when he would be there for two hours before my mom got home from work and feel like that was a home. The violence did not stop. I was told constantly that I was a freak, that I should commit suicide, and that I did not deserve anything good in this life. I tell you this because I can see how and why some of us will not be able to project good back out into this world at this time or at another time in our lives. The fight was absolutely taken out of me. I was prevented from feeling anything positive, and how could I ever reflect the good back in my life when I knew there would always be someone right there shutting it down? I tell you this because my brother was my biggest bully, both in school and at home. He was in and out of rehabilitation for drug addiction and college for the majority of my high school career, and I'm sad to say for the majority of my college career as well. The turning point was the winter break of my first year in college, where two weeks post-top surgery, my brother was slamming my head into our kitchen floor, telling me I was worthless and to once again kill myself or he would. After I managed to stand up and run upstairs, he yelled after me that I was a tranny again and should die because no one loves me or will ever love me. I'm thankful that I am loved. My mom, coming in from outside, said to him that that language was not tolerated in our house, that he could not treat me that way, and that he had to leave. He pulled a knife on her, and I called 911 upstairs in my bedroom, sobbing, the most scared that I've ever been in my entire life. I heard, I heard him yelling, and I eventually found out that he had pointed the knife at himself and left our house. A couple of minutes later, the police came, and he calmly accepted arrest a few streets over. We got a restraining order but I still did not feel any safer. This was my brother. He was brought to my dad's house in the middle of nowhere in New Hampshire. No friends, no drugs, really nothing. Within a few months, we were surprised that he wasn't begging to come back home. To Massachusetts, where I suppose he realized that he'd taken away his own rights in his own home. My dad and mom were constantly blaming themselves, apologizing to me for having not done better. 
I wouldn't take it. I knew it was not their fault and that they were just as much victims as I had become. During the times of his bullying and abuse, I did whatever I could to make myself happy, to make myself feel a purpose, and to make myself feel like a human. I would go for long walks in the woods, listen to great music, play my guitar, write in my journal, write stories, and write poetry. I joined a band, I joined the chorus, I even auditioned for my senior class play, which was a musical and I had never been in a play before, and that was rough. <laughs> <laughs> I went for long bike rides with my friends, snuck out late at night to play thrilling games of manhunt, and befriended a wide range of social groups in my high school where I found support. While these things alone could not calm my shaking palms at every moment of every day, I felt productive in that I was becoming a better person myself. I knew I could not change my brother, but I knew I could change the way that I looked at him and the way that I looked at my own being. I spoke in front of the entire faculty in my high school, one of the proudest moments in my life, about bullying in our LGBT community. Three years later, when I went back to visit, one of the teachers remembered me from there, telling me that it opened her eyes and made her wish that she could change this culture. Now she is acting and representing the GSA in my school. A lot of good was peppered among these terrible bad things that happened during my high school, but I did my best to take the good and run with it when I could. Within a year of the restraining order, my brother had written me a letter. The letter apologized for every bad thing he had done to me and my mom and for how he felt he had ruined my life and I didn't deserve that. My heart was less hard after he was gone, and in some ways I missed him. I missed my brother, the sober, non-violent, non-hating brother I had grown up with. I missed the memory of the good times in between, but was still rattled by the bad. In the past two years since I got that letter, I am proud to say that my brother is actually one of my biggest supporters and quite possibly one of the few family members I feel I can trust with anything. I asked him before I shared this story with you guys if it would be okay for me to share it because I'm so proud of how far he has come. He said that that's absolutely okay and he wishes he could be here. In the past two years, he has found a full-time job, re-entered college at UMass Dartmouth that is engaged to a gentle, accepting, and amazingly caring individual. Strange thing is that she had actually seen my YouTube videos of my transition before even meeting him and was in full support. I think that's a good sign. In the past two years, my brother has done his best to quit his addictions and I've watched his anger peel off of him. And when he finally came back down to Massachusetts to visit, I was sitting at my kitchen table and one of his old high school friends, someone I didn't really like, he brought into the house and he turned to Zach and he said, this is my brother Scott. I know you used to know him as my little sister, but he's my little brother, and if you have any problem with that, you're gonna have to talk with me. So, a little hostile, but all I could see was his love. <laughs> After that conversation, we were on the front porch, and he looked me straight in the eye to say that he was proud to call me his little brother, that he had always wanted a little brother, and out of all the transgender little brothers he could picture or imagine, <laughs> that I was perfect. <laughs> Every time these conversations happened, he would bring up how sorry he was, even crying as he remembered what he had done and the person he had been. At last, I told him to stop apologizing because I had forgiven him, as had my mom and dad. I told him I felt he was a good person who had done some bad things and to never let those bad things haunt him. But the truth is, those bad things haunt him every single day. I know that they do. I can see it in his eyes. I can see it in how nervous he is. He doesn't think that he deserves to be happy, especially around me. I think he's constantly trying to make up for it, and I'm constantly trying to get him to stop. The only thing I have faith in is that as time passes and my brother and I become real brothers, real friends again as we are, we are creating happier memories by the minute. The only thing I have faith in is that my brother will someday realize that these good times, full of love, acceptance, understanding, and growth, vastly overpower the hatred he had portrayed in his youth into this world and onto me. I love my brother, and he loves me, and I'm proud to be able to say that, even though he's my biggest bully. <laughs> so, during his widely controversial Breaking the Silence speech about nonviolence and against the war in Vietnam, April 4th, 1967, in New York City, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, We can no longer afford to worship the god of hate or bow before the altar of retaliation. The oceans of history are made of turbulent by the ever-rising tides of hate. And history is cluttered with the wreckage of nations and individuals that pursued the self-defeating path of hate. And he quotes Arnold Toynbee saying, Love is the ultimate force that makes the saving choice of life and good against the damning choice of death and evil. Therefore, the first hope in our inventory must be the hope that love is going to have the last word. I'm proud to say that I fully believe that love will have the last word in my relationship with my brother. And I know that I'm lucky to be able to say this. 
As human beings, we ruminate and fixate on the bad. I do it, we all do it to a certain extent. That's why I think it's pretty natural. When something bad happens, it overtakes us and makes us forget all that's good. It rattles around in our heads and our hearts like a cage. It knocks out everything else, muting them, pushing it against the wall. We forget the good in the face of the bad. We remember the time when we were bullied, and we forget the time that our friends stood up for us. In the face of the tragedy in Boston, a friend of mine recalled a quote she had heard, where when a boy was younger and would see violence and scary news on TV, he would, his mom would turn to him to reassure him and comfort him by saying, but look at all the helpers. The helpers were those who ran towards the victims because they knew they could assist. The helpers were those who didn't run away from the victims because they wanted to wait for help. The helpers were everywhere. What I ask of us all in the face of bullying in our schools is this. Let us be helpers. When I was first coming out during my sophomore year in high school, my best friend Amy stood beside me and would correct people who mispronounced me or did not remember to call me Skylar. She was my biggest helper. This took a huge load off my shoulders because constantly correcting or asserting others about my identity was exhausting and in many cases resulted in my feeling misunderstood or unaccepted. Amy was my helper and is absolutely reciprocal. So let's be helpers. Let's, spread, let's send the message of love and goodness and humanity back to the faces of the bullies. Let's stand up for our friends, our complete strangers, or even our enemies when they are bullied. Let's speak in a way that reflects, listens, questions intentions, and asserts our humanity, rather than in an angry way that only invites more anger. We should not be mirrors of anger. Everyone out here is just such a beautiful human being. We should be mirrors of that beauty that is inside of us and reflect that back in the face of anger. Yelling back at someone who's yelling at you is often what the bully expects. We've heard that cliche so many times. So let's change the status quo and, represent, and respond and represent our own confidence, security, and our ability to know that we can make a positive change and end the hatred and bad that this person is putting into our world. We cannot rewrite our histories, but we can speak our future. I cannot change what my brother did or how he feels now, but I can share with you how he has grown, how I have grown over the years to see it in a positive light, and how I'm continuing to forgive and accept what happened. It's important for us to share our stories about being bullied, whether they're ongoing, never-ending, already over, good, or bad. It's important to share them, because everyone will in some way be able to relate. Someone out there understands and cares. We all have things in common. We're all different. That was pretty cliche too, but that's okay. Each and every single one of us is. The differences amount to such beauty. That is the human condition that I want to see. I don't want to see the human condition of hatred. I want to see the human condition of being true and being a beautiful being. The main reason I see bullies picking on us in the LGBT community is because they see this difference and they attack it. How could such hatred come from such a beautiful component of humanity? If I knew this answer, I wouldn't have to be speaking today. But what I do know is we have the ability to change the energy of our world. What I do know is not a single one of you is alone in this. What I want you to know is that if I could be there to speak up for you when you can't speak up for yourselves, I would in a heartbeat. That is my biggest wish. And someone should always be there. I think we're getting closer to that moment, but I want that moment to be now. I, I will hope that you will turn right now to a stranger or friend next to you and let them know that you will be there, that you would speak up. Preferably a stranger, but friends are great too. So let's take a couple seconds to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I see some long distance uh, friendships forming here. <laughs> so as we can see, we're not alone and somebody cares. Today is a day for us to speak our voices and our stories. It is crucial to share our stories of being bullied as well as our stories of being helped, as our growth and experiences from these will only help others. We need to remember what has happened, what is going on, in order to change it for the future. By sharing our stories, whether they're good, bad, ongoing, over, life-shattering, we can lift the silence that they have placed upon us. The more we shake the silence, the more we shake this dust, the more we can remember the good that has happened in our lives that has brought us to today. The more that we shake this silence and the more that we shake this dust, the more we can be ourselves and let our true selves shine out through every inch of our being. I wanted to end this by sharing with you my favorite poem. This is a poem that I listen to every single time that I'm sad. I write poems myself, but I feel like this poem was written before I ever had the chance to write it. It's 
by Anis Mojani, and it's a poem called Shake the Dust. This is for the fat girls. This is for the little brothers. This is for the schoolyard wimps. This is for the childhood bullies who tormented them. This is for the former prom queen. This is for the milk crate ball players. This is for the nighttime cereal eaters and the retired elderly Walmart store front door greeters. Shake the dust. This is for the benches and the people sitting upon them. For the bus drivers driving a million broken hymns. For the men who have to hold down three jobs simply to hold up their children. For the nighttime schoolers and the midnight bike riders who are trying to fly. Shake the dust. This is for the two-year-olds who cannot be understood because they speak half English and half God. Shake the dust. For the girls with the brothers who are going crazy. For those gym class wallflowers and the 12-year-olds afraid of taking public showers. For the kid who's always late to class because he forgets the combination to his locker. For the girl who loves somebody else. Shake the dust. This is for the hard men. The hard men who want to love but know that it won't come. For the ones who are forgotten. The ones the amendments do not, do not stand up for. For the ones who are told to speak only when you are spoken to and then are never spoken to. Speak every time you stand so you do not forget yourself. Do not let a moment go by that does not remind you that your heart beats hundreds of thousand times a day and that there are enough gallons of blood to make you an ocean. Do not settle for letting these waves settle and the dust to collect in your veins. This is for the celibate pedophile who keeps on struggling, for the poetry teachers and for the people who go on vacations alone, for the sweat that drips off Mick Jagger's singing lips and for the shaking skirt on Tina Turner's shaking hips, for the heavens and for the hells through which Tina has lived. This is for the tired and for the dreamers, and for those families who will never be like the Cleavers, with the perfectly made dinners and sons like Wally and the Beaver. This is for the bigots, this is for the sexists, this is for the killers. This is for the big house jail sentence cats becoming redeemers, and for the springtime that somehow always shows up after the winters. This, this is for you. This is for you. Make sure that by the time the fisherman returns, you are gone. Because just like the days I burn at both ends, and every time I write, every time I open my eyes, I am cutting out parts of myself just to give them to you. So shake the dust and take me with you when you do, for none of this has ever been for me. All that pushes and pulls, it pushes and pulls, it pushes for you. So grab this world by its clothespins and shake it out again and again, and jump on top and take it for a spin, and when you hop off, shake it again, for this is yours. Make my words worth something. Make this more than just another poem that I write. Not just another poem, like just another night that sits heavy above us all. Walk into it. Breathe it in. Let it crash through the halls of your arms. And at the millions of years, at the millions of poets, coursing like blood, pumping and pushing, making you live, shaking the dust so when the world knocks at your front door, clutch the knob tightly and open it on up. Run forward into its widespread greeting arms, with your hands before you, fingertips trembling though they